So this is a pleasure to introduce Dimitris Petsopoulos, uh, who works in the Bayosta department uh, in the very large medical center of Erasmus in Rotterdam, uh, which is a center that covers different fields. There is clearly a strong oncology department, but also cardiovascular. So I think that we'll have examples, uh, maybe in different fields, but carrying over should not be quite an issue. Uh, so we, we're very happy to listen to you for 45 minutes, plus 15 minutes of questions, and uh, she will keep the time. OK, good uh, morning to everyone, also from my part. I should start by saying that Bordeaux is my favorite city in France. <laughs> but because the chair is also from Paris, so I have to be a bit careful to so say both Bordeaux and Paris are my favorite cities. Okay. <laughs> I have 15 minutes now. OK, that's great. OK, so uh, since we are now in the session of uh, joint models, and uh, I thought of starting uh, saying a few things about these models, so a little bit of how they are defined and how we can use them uh, to derive dynamic predictions on the theme uh, of uh, the workshop. So first let me say that these models have been around for quite some many years, <coughs> so 15, 20 years. Uh, initial research has focused on properties of the models, estimating these models with different kinds of algorithms and so on. Uh, but more recently, uh, there has been a lot of interest in using joint models for providing individualized predictions which is the topic that uh, I would like to talk about here today. So, um, for my talk, I will have four goals, uh, actually. First, a little bit to introduce this joint model, so what is the intuitive idea behind them. Then, to show you how we can use these models to derive these kind of predictions. Then, I would like to focus on one very uh, important aspect that I find when it also comes to predictions, and this is how we can actually model the association between the longitudinal and the survival outcomes. And in the final part, I would like to talk about some recent uh, research that I'm doing and, and actually how we can uh, combine uh, different types of joint models. OK, so uh, as I said, I uh, don't actually have any example in a cancer study. I don't work that much with cancer. Maybe that will change in the future. But I work a lot with people with cardiovascular diseases. And in this particular example uh, is from the Department of Thorax Surgery of our university, where we have about 290 uh, patients who received a uh, human tissue valve in the outer position. We have two groups of patients, uh, about 80 patients receiving a subcoronary implantation and 210 patients a root, complete root, root replacement. And here we're going to focus on two outcomes. First, we have a composite event. So we did have death of the reoperation, but for simplicity, I'm going to consider the composite event. We could also consider computer risk settings, but I'm going to leave that aside uh, for the moment. And the marker that uh, we have is the output gradient. So it's a marker that measures how well the valve performs uh, in, uh, in these patients. And the research question that we would like uh, to answer in this uh, type of patients is that because we have repeated evaluations of this RT gradient, if we could use this marker to predict the risk for reoperation or death. OK, so um, this is our primary uh, research question. And of course, it's evident that in order to answer this question, what we will need to do is to postulate a model that relates uh, the, two, uh, the two outcomes. So the aortic gradient and the time to death or reoperation. Now, uh, before discussion of how we can do it, first let me say a little bit of something, a term that we also heard about yesterday, about endogenous and exogenous uh, covariates. And it turns out that barrier markets in general are a difficult type of time-dependent covariate. So in this setting, we would like to use the aortic gradient as a time-dependent covariate. So biomarkers are endogenous, where what this exactly means, endogenous, it means that the future path of this time-dependent covariate could be affected by an event happening at an earlier time point. I know that this is a little bit of a, of a technical definition, and let me give you an example, again from a completely different setting to make it a little bit more clear to really understand what is uh, the intuition behind the endogenous variable. So let's say that I'm taking 
uh, patients with uh, asthma problems, and I'm interested in the time until they have an asthma attack. And I'm going to consider two time-dependent covariates. One could be a biomarker for asthma, and the other is an environmental factor, let's say pollution levels, that could also affect the time of an asthma attack. So let's go in them and decode which one is endogenous and which one is not. Now, what, as I said, the definition says, it says that the future path of the covariate is affected by an event happening at an earlier time point. So, if a patient has an asthma attack now, will this affect the air pollution levels tomorrow? Of course not. So, if a patient has an asthma attack today, it has nothing to do with the air pollution tomorrow. However, if we think about the biomarker, if he has an asthma attack today, and because the biomarker is related to asthma attack, we would expect the biomarker to be affected by the occurrence of an event. So, in this case, we say that we have an endogenous covariate. Now, what are some special characteristics of these endogenous covariates? First is that they are measured with error, but this is not a defined characteristic of this time-dependent covariate, because we could say also the pollution levels are measured with error. So we don't know exactly the levels of pollution in the area the patient was living. We know in the greater area, but not, let's say, in his neighborhood. Now, a second one is that we don't have the complete history available. And this is more uh, of a problem with endogenous covariates and biomarkers. What I mean by that is that I only know the value of the biomarker at the time point when the patient came to the study center to give me a blood sample. So I don't know what was the value of the biomarker in between. And the final one, and also an important one, is that the, le the existence of the time-dependent covariate is directly related to the failure status. And this is more in particular when we're interested uh, when the failure status is death. So if a patient dies, of course, he doesn't have the biomarker anymore. Or if the patient has the biomarker, it means that he's still alive. Whereas, again, if we compare it with air pollution, if I know the air pollution at a specific day, I don't know if the patient was alive at the same day. Whereas if I know the biomarker at a specific day, I know that the patient was alive at this day. So these are some... Um, some characteristics that we have in the endogenous covariates. Now, why I'm saying all this? I'm saying all this because our traditional time-dependent box model that we could use in this setting, because we have a time-dependent covariate, works, theoretically works for exogenous covariates, and does not work for endogenous ones. And, of course, we could still use uh, the Cox model even if, we, even if we have an endogenous covariate, but it has been a lot of research done in the uh, area of joint modeling, both theoretical work and simulation work, that shows that if we ignore the special features of endogenous covariates, we could severely underestimate the association size, so how strongly associated is the biomarker with the risk for an event, which, of course, when it comes also to prediction, could mask the true predictive ability uh, of the biomarker. So if I show it uh, with a small figure, what I mean by that, what the Cox model assumes, when if I would like to fit uh, a biomarker with the Cox model, assumes a kind of a step function path for my covariate, which is, of course, not, not that logical to assume for a biomarker. So it's not logical to say that in between uh, visits, so here from the baseline to the next visit, the level of the biomarker remains constant, and then suddenly change when the patient came to the standard center. So having this kind of step function approximation for a biomarker is not, is not as much logical for um, this type of variables. Okay, so uh, to account for these special features of uh, biomarkers, the framework of joint models for longitudinal and time event data has been developed. Where, very simply put, what is the intuitive idea behind these models is actually to use, also the name says, two models. So I'm going to treat both of them as outcomes. So in the case of the time-dependent Cox model, I'm treating the biomarker only as covariate. Now in these models, I'm going to treat both of them as outcomes. I'm going to put a separate model for each one of these outcomes, and I'm just going to connect them in some way. So the intuitive idea is that I put a model for the biomarker to describe the profile of the patients 
uh, in time for each one separately. And then I take this estimated profile and then put it in my Cox model. And of course, as I'm not assume now anymore that the level of the biomarker is constant. So if I would like again to show it with the same kind of plot. So here we have on the top panel the hazard uh, process. On the bottom panel we have with asterisks the longitudinal responses of biomarker levels. So I'm not going to do the step function approximation, but I'm going to assume a kind of a smooth evolution of the biomarker in time. And now what I'm going to say is not the observed level of the market that's associated with the hazard, but this is underlying profile that is associated with the hazard at any particular time point D. So this is simply the idea behind these models. So let me then introduce it a little bit more formally. So I'm going to denote by Ti star the true uh, event time for our patients. By Ti and delta i is the observed information, so the observed event times, and delta i is the event indicator, so one if there's truly an event and zero for sensory. And I'm going also to denote by yi uh, the longitudinal responses, so the output gradient uh, in our example. So how do we define uh, joint models? Uh, as I said, we do it in a sense, uh, we, we define in a sense separate models. So first, we define a model for the survival component, <coughs> where I put an ordinary Cox model, a relative risk model, where I say the hazard of any patient I at a particular time point T is a baseline hazard. These are baseline covariates. And here is my marker. So now here is the difference Again, with the Cox model, in the Cox model, I put here the observed value of the time-dependent covariate, whereas in the joint model, I put this MIT, where MIT, if I go back, is the underlying profile. So MIT is the value of the longitudinal trajectory, at the underlying longitudinal trajectory of each patient. Okay, so this is how uh, the model is defined, but of course, the problem is that in this model, I don't know MIT. I don't know this underlying profile. So what I'm going to do, as I said, I'm going to use another model to estimate it. So I'm going to put a model for to say that the observed longitudinal response are equal to the underlying profile uh, of the patient plus an error term. Now, where this error term accounts for uh, this measurement error that I mentioned a little bit earlier, which in some cases could have to do that really measurement error, but in some biomarkers I cannot measure them accurately enough. But also it encompasses biological variation. So even though I could measure a biomarker exactly, for let's say I have a very good test to you know, really show me the level of the biomarker, even though I could measure the same patients twice on the same day, I will not observe exactly the same level for this biomarker because it's a biological machine in the human and has some biological variability. So this also encompasses this uh, type of variation. Now, the other key part that I do is how do I decompose the MIT, so the, the profile. So what I do, typically in this type of models, we put a mixed effects model. So we have some fixed effects and some random effects component. And here the design vectors for the fixed effects and random effects are time dependent. So they have the time component inside. And I can be, in, in the specification of that, as flexible as possible. So I can put uh, simple linear evolutions. But if linear evolutions are not logical for my biomarker, I can put uh, polynomials, fractional polynomials, lines. Uh, you can do whatever you like. Now, another key, uh, as I said, important feature of this, uh, why I use mixed models, is because I have these random effects. And I need the random effects in order to make the profile from the model subspecific. So each one of my patients has his own profile in time. So I, can ha I could have patients who have a constant profile in time. I could have patients who have an increasing profile in time, decreasing profile in time. Some of them could be simply linear. For some out of them could be nonlinear. By including these random effects, allow this to be completely uh, sub specific. Okay. Now the last step of how we define the models is because I want to build and study the association. I don't estimate this model separately, but I do it in one step. I estimate the joint distribution. 
where the key assumption that I have behind is that the random effects are shared by the two processes, and which means that in a sense, conditionally on the random effects, I assume that the longitudinal biomarker and the time to event are independent. So in a sense, these random effects explain all the association behind the two outcomes. OK, so that was a very uh, brief introduction of this type of models. As I said, there has been a lot of research of how we can estimate them using maximum likelihood, using MCMC, and so on. But uh, fo uh, focusing on uh, the theme of the workshop, um, I'm not going to say any more details about, about that, but I would like to say how can we use these models in order to derive predictions. And uh, let's say now that we have the joint model, we have fitted it in a particular data set, and we have a new patient coming from the same kind of population, which I'm going to call patient J. And in particular, I, I'm going to do it for two patients from my uh, motivated data set. So I take patient 20 and patient 81 from the uh, aortic valve uh, data set, for which I would like to use in order to derive uh, predictions. So uh, also in these models, we have the dynamic nature uh, built in uh, directly in the models. And um, what I mean by that is something that we also uh, saw to the guest that they came, that these are the profiles of the two patients. So let me say that an increasing level of the aortic gradient is indicative of the worsening of the condition of the patients. So this is the profile. And what I can do also in these models, I can say that I can go up to a particular time point T, use all the biomarker levels that I have recorded up to this time point T, <coughs> and then produce a prediction. And when I have a new measurement, I can update the prediction. And therefore move in a time dynamic manner, in the same sense as uh, we saw uh, yesterday with uh, lab marking. Okay, so let's see a little bit again more formally of how we do that. So remember why uh, J is, uh, sorry, J is my new patient, and I'm going to denote by uh, YJ his longitudinal measurements up to a particular time point in. So this is a whole history of measurements that I have recorded for this patient up to this time point. So what we are interested in estimating is uh, actually conditional survival probabilities. So to say that given the information that I have at time point T, and what information do I have at time point T, that the patient was still alive, and he had given me all these measurements, and given also the past data that I have, so given the model that I have fitted in the previous patients, what will be the probability that this patient is going to survive time U, or U is greater than T? Okay, so based on the joint model that I have already fitted data, I would like to derive this prediction for this new patient. Now, uh, of course, to move forward, I am assuming here implicitly that I have estimated the model in the uh, original data set using either MCMC or maximum likelihood, doesn't matter. But I would like a little bit to discuss of how we can uh, derive this prediction under the joint model. Um, we could think of two ways to proceed. One is more under the maximum likelihood uh, approach, where we can use empirical-based um, statements, where we can plug in estimates for the random effects and estimates for the parameters. But especially if we're interested in estimating standard error, using a fully based approach or a Monte Carlo approach could be uh, more advantageous. So I put here some references where you can find uh, more details of how it's done. But very simply, let me say of how, uh, what are the basic steps. So the idea is to devise a Monte Carlo scheme to estimate these probabilities. And as I said, if you want to propagate uh, uh, uncertainty, then it's advantageous to work under a Bayesian kind of framework. So we have these probabilities that I want to estimate, and I write their posterior expectation with respect to the posterior, parameter, the posterior of the parameters. So here in this posterior of the parameters is where the information from the original data set comes from for this new patient. And then the first part of the integrand, I can rewrite it in an easy form using the conditional independence assumption. So that given the random effects, the two processes are independent. Now, uh, all this seems uh, a little bit technical, but what I can do is, as I said, I can devise an easy Monte Carlo scheme. 
So uh, steps one and two propagate uncertainty. So step one propagates the uncertainty in the parameters. And if I compete it with MCMC, this is just by taking a value from the posterior sample of, uh, uh, of our MCMC for the parameters. If I compete it with maximum likelihood, I can assume kind of an asymptotic Bayesian argument. So to say that if I have sufficiently large sample size, the posterior of the parameters given the data will be approximated by a normal distribution which is centered around the MLEs and with variance covariance matrix, the variance matrix of the MLEs. So at this step, I draw a value for the parameters uh, in order to propagate the uncertainty in the model parameters. Then, given this value, at step two, I estimate what will be plausible values for the round effect of the new patient. So again, we say that given the, the previous data that you had and given the data of this new patient, what would be logical values for his round effects? We are remember that this round effects dictate how the profile of the patient looks like. So in a sense, by drawing this round of effects, we say that this patient has that kind of profile. And now, using these values of the round of effects, I can simply plug it in in the previous equation that we have, that I simply have, I have to calculate the ratio of the corresponding survival probabilities. So taking the theta and the b, I plug it in the ratio of survival probabilities, and then I have an estimate for uh, my, um, uh, for, for my, like, for the probability some I'm interested in, the survival probabilities. And if I do that a number of times, let's say L times, I can simply take the average as a, a point estimate of the survival probabilities. Okay, so let's go and see it now uh, in practice <coughs> a little bit. So I'm going to fit a joint model to the aortic valve data set. Um, and uh, I would like to produce predictions for the two patients that we saw, so patient 20 and uh, 81. And uh, in order to be fair in a sense, in the model that I fitted, these patients have been excluded. So I'm going to treat as patients 20 and 81 as future patients from the same kind of population. So the model is fitted without these two patients. So for the longitudinal component, and in order to be flexible a little bit in the in the estimation of the profile of aortic gradient, I have put splines in, in both the fixed effects and the round effects and design matrices. And for the survival, I have put some baseline covariates, namely the type of operation, age, gender, the and, and the aortic gradient value that, sorry, that has been estimated from the mixed model. And the baseline hazard, I estimated using the risk lines. So I did the model actually using MCMC. And then for the, two, for the two patients that I have left outside, I used this Monte Carlo scheme that I described with you to calculate these conditional survival probabilities. So to illustrate uh, the dynamic nature uh, of how this proceeds, what I'm going to do for these patients, I'm going to cut each time uh, at this vertical line that you see here. So this could be considered kind of uh, the landmark that uh, Kane talked about yesterday. So uh, each time I cut at this particular time point, and then I use the information that I have recorded up to this time point to produce predictions, okay, for both of the patients. So this is how it looks like. So when I go to the first uh, landmark point, now how we read these plots? On the x-axis we have time, <coughs> On here, on that axis, on the left side, we have the aortic gradient uh, of the patients, and on that axis, you can read the estimated survival probabilities. So these are the estimated survival probabilities then for our two patients, using this measurement for patient 20 and using these two measurements for patient 81. Well, you can see that based on these two measurements, this is the estimated profile that I have from the model for this patient. And I can move forward to the next time point and the next time point. And <coughs> again, each time I have a new measurement, and I can update the survival probabilities. So just to say also a feature, because we, we know that this marker, this particular marker, is very noisy. Uh, the model that I have fitted was not actually a, a classical linear mixed model. 
but I have put the error terms um, in this multiple <coughs> time speed and state distribution to allow for outliers because, as I said, there's a lot of noise in the market. And you see here that even though I have this low value, the, the, the level of the, the estimated profile of the biomarker is not affected that much. So um, if we have even this kind of situation, we can build it in, in our model to take that into account. OK. So this then is um, a little bit of how these predictions are calculated under uh, the John model. But as I said, all this is done work. So Cecile, Jeremy have worked also a lot in this area of how we can derive uh, these predictions. And so up to now, we could say it was a little bit of review what already is already there. Now, I would like uh, to focus on two other aspects. And as I said, the first aspect is about uh, how do I model the association between the two outcomes and if this has an impact. So uh, the standard join model that we have used and also that this also holds for the box model. So when we typically have a time dependent covariate, the default that we are using is this type of model <coughs> where we say that the hazard at this particular time point T depends either on the observed level of the marker in the Cox model or the estimated level of the marker in the join model at the same time point T. So again, if I want, let me remind you this figure. So this is what I say. At any particular time point T, is that this value of the biomarker is related with the hazard at the same time point. But of course, a relevant question is, is this the only option that we have? And this is the most optimal option also with respect to prediction. And the answer is no, and this is because we have a whole process in time. So the whole time dependent covariate is a whole time dependent process. And it could be the different characteristics of this process would be more related to our risk and more predictive for the risk that we are trying to study. So let me then show you a little bit of some other options that we have of how, by, can, how can we uh, build the association between the market, between the market and the survival outcome. So the first one that I'm going to consider is the one that uh, also Jeremy has, I think, first proposed. And this is to include <coughs> in uh, the relative risk model not only the level of the biomarker, but also the slope of the trajectory, so in a sense the dynamics of the biomarker. And if I would like to see that again in a plot, so here I consider different time points. So I say at any particular time point, the risk is not dependent only on the level, but also of how fast the market is changing. Or if the market has an increasing trajectory of an increasing one. And for instance, if we could compare these two time points, we see that the level of the market is more or less the same. But here clearly the, the profile has a decreasing uh, trend, where here has an increasing one. So if we fit the standard join model, we do not capture the situation. That in one case, the trajectory has an increasing trend or increasing trend. So um, of course, under the join model, it means that I just take my, the linear predictor of my mixed model, and I just take the derivative with respect to time. And I can calculate that and then put that in my uh, linear predictor. So this is one option. Another kind of option that we have is to consider cumulative effects. So not to say, so both the, the previous two, they say that the hazard now depends on features of the trajectory now. So only a single time point, but does not consider the previous time points. So we could, uh, in a sense, overcome that by saying, I want to take all the past values of the trajectory into account. And I can do that by putting the inner cloud in the linear predictor. So I say that the risk now depends on, in the sense of a weighted average of the biomarker up to this 5.8. And again, with a figure, now we say that the risk depends on this whole area under the trajectory of the subject. And we can even go a step further and say, is it logical to consider all the past values in the same manner? Or could I also put a weight on them to say, for instance, that the values that are closer to T should have higher weight compared to values that come, let's say, from baseline. So we could even augment the previous type of association structure with a weight function that can build this type of, um, this type of relationship. 
job or excellence, we could put here a PDF from a standard distribution, let's say the ocean distribution, the student distribution, to have this half density, to have this, uh, to treat this as a wage function. And one final option that we have, which I personally do not like that much, but it has been used a lot in the literature, is just to include in the linear predictor of the relative risk model just random effects. Um, so this type of formulation has only a logical interpretation when I have simple nanometers of some of slopes. So not in my case where I have splines, because random effects do not bear any physical interpretation. But nonetheless, since here we are just interested in prediction, we are not that much interested in interpretation of the alpha, so we could also consider this as an alternative uh, formulation. So just let me say that all this that I showed you are just a few examples. And the point that I would like to make is that, again, <coughs> because we have all this time-dependent process, will be different characteristics that are more uh, predictive. And as I said, this is just a few examples, but could be other types of formulations that we could postulate that are more relevant for a particular uh, data set. OK, so now the next question, does it really matter So uh, to do all these strange uh, association structures? So let me take again uh, one of the two patients that I have, patient 81. So which, again, remember, this is the one that I have left uh, outside uh, from the study. And now, again, I would like to do dynamic predictions for these patients. For this patient, sorry. But uh, I'm going to augment the exercise that I did before. So before, I assumed only the standard joint model that says the risk now depends on the level of the biomarker now. So I'm going to augment that with the other association structures that I have introduced. So uh, I fit it again, uh, the, the model, not only model, actually I fit it five uh, joint models. So this is the, as I said, the standard one. So I put also the slope inside. I put the cumulative effect. Then I put the weighted cumulative effect, where I put as weights uh, the density of the normal distribution, appropriately uh, standardized. So to say that, and I have put the standard normal PDF, so in a sense, I consider only the, the last three year measurements as more relevant, because after three years, the density is almost zero, so the weight zero, so the, the, the levels of the biomarker three years before do not count anymore. And the last one, I have put also the random effects, uh, is the last parameterization where I just put in the random effects. Where I have four random effects, it's the random intercepts, and these come from the spline terms, which, as I said again, do not have any logical interpretation, but still I can derive predictions from this model. Let's see if they are good, yes or no. Okay, so these are the prediction now, so a little bit of a different plot. What do we read now in this plot? Uh, in each one of the panels, I have the different joint models. So this is, with the, this is the standard joint model that has only the value. So it's the value and the slope, the cumulative effect, so the area under the trajectory, the weighted area, and the random effects. And now, what do we read in each panel? Uh, I did it again in a dynamic matter and dynamic sorry, uh, manner, and I, each panel each is the time point of a measurement that I have for, for the patient. So this patient has six measurements, so this is based on his first measurement. And each time I predict for one year in advance. So my horizon is one year after the measurement that I have. So we clearly see that not that much for earlier time points, but later on I have a very a huge difference between the association structures. And this was not only for this patient, so I have also done the same exercise for other patients from the same data set. And the point was that really the predictions were affected by the association structure that I was assuming for, my, uh, for the journey model. Okay, so now let's take it um, even a step further. So we have seen that the association structure could have an influence on the device prediction. <coughs> and uh, the, of course, the next logical question is how, what is the most optimal level? So where I should, how should I derive the predictions based on which model? And the easy answer to that would be, uh, let's say, to employ information criteria. So if we do maximum likelihood, we have AIC, BIC. If we do Bayesian, we have BIC, and so on. So we could uh, decide on a model 
based uh, on this information criteria. But actually, I wanted to do a little bit better. And if we also think about it, uh, I think a little bit more deeply, is it fair to say, especially when we want to apply a prediction model in a pragmatic situation, that a single model is best for all the patients that I have? Maybe this would be the case if I do it in a simulation scenario, but I think in real life, many times we cannot say that our single model is most optimal for all the patients that I have. So um, what I would like then uh, to do is actually take this picture into account, and I'm going to take that into account using the Bayesian machinery, and uh, more specifically the, the, the idea of Bayesian model averaging. So what I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that I have not one uh, model, but I have fitted a battery of models, so let's say K possible models, which could have different association structures, they could have different baseline covariates, they could make different assumptions for the mixed model and so on. And the idea now is to base predictions not in a single model, but in a sense in all of the, all of the models at the same time, um, and choosing in a, in, a, in a correct manner. So. Again, what I want to do, let me uh, remind you, uh, I have fitted all this uh, battery of models in my original data set, uh, which will denote by dn, and I have a new patient, patient J, who has survived up to t and has new measurements up to this time point t. And again, I want to estimate the same kind of survival probabilities. But now, I'm not going to do it, as I said, based on a single model but I'm going to average over the models. So these are uh, the average uh, conditional survival probabilities, where the blue part here adjusts the survival probabilities from each particular model. So from each particular model, I can uh, de derive the probabilities as I have shown you, like for patient A1, each one of the panels. And I have to weight them appropriately using the posterior weights. So what is the weight of uh, this model given the data. Now, a very nice and uh, cool feature that I like in this particular setting is that we need to take into account in this setting that I have two sources of information in these weights. So I have the old data, so the data on which I pick the, the, the model, but I also I have the data of the new patient. So what are again the data of the new patient? data is that he has survived up to t and his longitudinal measurements. Now, if we go and work these posterior weights, we see that these posterior weights depend also on the data on the new patient, which means that the posterior weight, so how probable each model is, is not depending only on the past data that I have seen, but also depends on the new data that I have seen for this particular patient. And so the weights are both patient specific and time specific. So as time moves forward, it would be that the trajectory of the patient is more well described by one, let's say, mixed model on the other, and therefore I could change in time between models according to where the trajectory of that particular patient has a higher probability of coming from. Okay, so uh, in that sense, uh, by applying this idea, we have predictions that are better tailored to the patient because at any particular time point, I put a higher weight to the model where this patient has high probability of coming from. So let's see it again uh, for a patient H1. If you remember, I have done all the predictions from the different models where I showed you all this panel. And now the idea is just uh, to combine them. So uh, I estimated this, uh, these weights. And now this is uh, what it comes from. So again, I have now with different lines, I have um, the different association structures, and with the red line is the weighted average. So again, we clearly see, as we said, that uh, the predictions from the association structures are not the same. So we do really have different predictions based on each one of the joint models. And now in this uh, particular case, um, the and also for the first measurement is actually under the red line, the value and slope, uh, the value and slope joint model has the higher posterior weight. So using only the first uh, measurement, this is where I put the subject. And why is that? Of course, I don't have any information for the subject, 
So in this case, only for the first measurement, the majority of the information comes from the past data. So the past data and the past data, the value and slope parameterization had a higher posterior weight. So this is why I based predictions with that one. But as time then goes on, uh, <coughs> you see that their predictions could, could, uh, could shift. In the majority of the cases, they stay with the value and slope parameterization. But in some cases, they also will go uh, to the other ones, depending on the features of the profile of the patient. OK. So that was it, actually. So let me close uh, with a little bit about the software. Uh, so you can fit join models uh, under maximum likelihood using uh, the package that I have written called JM. Um, and you can do the predictions that I described here using the function called surfing JM. And another thing that I didn't discuss at all, but you can also do it under the joint modeling framework, is that you can also do predictions for the non student outcome. So not only for uh, the survival, but also to say what would be the future uh, trajectory of the patient. And this you can do with the predict function. And more details uh, can be found uh, in a recent book uh, that I have published. But with respect to this talk, um, I also have another package, a newer package called JM Base that fits the models using MCMC. And in this one, we again have the same function to do the predictions, but I also have a, a DMA function that combines models with different predictions. So to do the, the idea that I just presented <coughs> here, so if you have fitted a battery of models of how you can combine them using the Bayesian model average and idea. Okay, so. That was it. Thank you very much.